Hey, this is Mike Freilink. I'm the pastor at The Gathering, and I'd like to welcome you today as you listen to this week's message. I pray it encourages you, challenges you, and draws you closer to God and His purposes for your life. Here's a little proverb for you. You don't need a parachute to go skydiving, but you do need a parachute to go skydiving twice. Yeah, it's all right, yeah. And here's another one. As I get older, I remember all the people that I lost along the way. Maybe my budding career as a tour guide was not the right choice at the time. <laughs> that was a bit, bit dry, that one. That's all right. <laughs> Work on that for next time. Today's message is called Answer the Call. Who's ever had their phone ring and they look down at the phone and they see the name of the number and they just go, ugh. I've never had it. I'm just wondering if you guys have. (laughs) And you go, can I be bothered? Do I have the time? And you look down and you go, do I answer it or not? And it's a really interesting one because when God asks us or rings our phone, do we look down at it and go, what's he up to? What does he want from me? See, God's desire is for us to answer the call. It's a definitive statement. It's not something that we, uh, I've said, it's deliberate to answer the call. It's not answering the call or plan to answer the call. It's answer the call. And what God's wanting from us is to step out in obedience and answer his call. Now, the challenge that I've had this week is that this message is about answering the call of what he's prepared to put on my heart this morning. It's funny when you you go through a week and you you think you've got a really good thought or a concept and then it gets to Friday and God says, throw all that out and start again. Because what he wants is obedience, not just our own ideas. He wants obedience. So if you've got your Bible this morning, I'd love you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. And we're going to read from the NIV. And we're going to read from verse 4. And then we're going to read to verse 10, skip down to verse 17, down to 19. And it says this, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, you were set apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone that I send you and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I point you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow and to build and to plant. And then if we scoot down to Verse 17, it says, get yourself ready, stand up to them, whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them or I, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah and its officials, its priests and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but not But will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. I felt as I was reading this passage of scripture this week that God's placed a couple of key principles in this passage for us to answer the call. First and foremost, we have to understand who God is and his sovereignty. We have to understand first and foremost that we are his masterpieces. You see, in verse 4 and 5, it says, Before I knew you, or before I had formed you, I knew you. I had appointed you to this task. See, that wasn't just a word for Jeremiah. That's a word for each and every one of us. That we are all individually and wonderfully made. We are created in God's image. And that's an amazing thought. See, for us to understand the call of God upon our life and when God does call, we have to trust in his sovereignty 
We have to trust in who he is and what he's called us to do. Ephesians chapter 2 says this in verse 10, For we are his workmanship. In the Amplified it goes, We are his workmanship, his own master work, a work of art, created in Christ, who is reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed and ready to be used for good works, which God prepared, but for us beforehand, taking paths which he set, that we would walk in them, living the good life that he had prearranged and made ready for us. In a couple of translations, it says we are his masterpieces. In a couple of other translations, it says we are his handiwork. But in the original text, it actually says that we are his workmanship. And that's very different. It's similar, but different. See, when we talk about our, his workmanship, this is an artisan who has sat there and crafted something out of dust. See, the word workmanship refers to more than a product of creation, but it refers to the degree of skill for which the product is made. The degree of skill imparts value to the thing made. For example, a vase. A vase is of excellent workmanship. But the vase itself is lovely, but the value is derived from the talents of the one who designed and produced it. So with this definition in mind, workmanship is more fitting than masterpiece of handiwork because the emphasis is placed on the creator rather than the creation. We are his workmanship. Jeremiah was his workmanship. God had said that I have formed you and I knew you. I had created you. I had designed you. I had knitted you together. And then that is exactly the same for us today. A few years ago, we went to uh, it was quite a few years ago, but we went to France and, and to Italy. And one of the things that we wanted to do over there was go to some of the art museums. Now, if you know me well, I have no interest in art. <laughs> Couldn't care less. But Clarissa studied Renaissance art at school. I'm like, cool, let's go and have a look at some of these art pieces. And I had heard that there was some amazing art like the Mona Lisa. Now, we had stayed with a, a, a gentleman there, and he said the best thing to do, we had to go to the Louvre, I think it's pronounced the Louvre Museum, it's the one with the glass pyramid in Paris, and uh, what you could do is you, you go in a separate entrance, he says, and then you make a beeline, get there early and go straight to the Mona Lisa, because the lines get long and, and all that sort of stuff, and you know, there's a barrier around it. I'm like, great, I've heard the Mona Lisa is amazing. And so um, I was really quite looking forward to it. I arrived at the Mona Lisa to be very underwhelmed. <laughs> I don't know if you know, but it's about that big. <laughs> and it's tiny. It's tiny. And it, I looked at it because I had walked past like 20 foot by 10 foot canvases, which was some guy's life on a canvas. I looked at the Mona Lisa and just went, eh. I said, Clarissa, Rick, quickly run up and take a picture and then we'll just go and see something else before all the other tourists got there. Uh, it was very underwhelming, but what I did discover later on is that I did a little bit of research because I'm thinking, why is this thing worth the amount of money that it is? And it was painted by Leonardo da Vinci, and, and what it was was that he used a certain technique, which I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but that technique was never used ever. And the way that he was able to capture light and do all of these other bits and pieces, that's apparently where the value lies. See, the value wasn't necessarily in the painting itself. The actual value laid in the fact that Leonardo da Vinci painted it. It's like looking at a Picasso. I could throw paint up against a canvas and just do a few little squiggly things. And so could Picasso, but his would be worth about $100 million more than mine because he's got a reputation for doing that. See, the value was in the creator of the product, not the creation. And so that's what God is saying to us, is that I value you, I know you, so I call you. What we then have to do is respond in obedience. So to answer the call, first and foremost, understand who God is and his sovereignty. And secondly, understand that he knows you. He knows the paths that he has set apart for you and that you are individually and wonderfully made. The second thing we can do, or the third thing we can do, is have a can-do attitude. I love that saying. I say that to my kids all the time. I don't want to hear negativity. 
on a can-do attitude. I can't do my maths, Dad. Yes, you can. I don't want to hear the word can't. And then I said, I can't be bothered teaching you. No, I don't say that. <laughs> Just kidding. Having a can-do attitude. Romans chapter 12, verse 22, uh, sorry, 12 and 2 says this. Do not be conformed by this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually. By the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, and his plan and his purposes for you. See, it actually takes discipline for us to go from having a mindset that is of the temporal to the eternal. What God was asking Jeremiah in verse 6 to 10 says this, Jeremiah said, Ah, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak as I'm only a child. But the Lord said to me, Do not say that I'm a child, for you go to everyone I send you, and whatever I command you, you will say. Do not be afraid of them, for I am willing to be with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Even God gives us the kick in the pants that we need sometimes. Sometimes we make excuses. I don't know if you know much about Jeremiah, but when he was called, he was only about, they reckon, between 17 and 20 when God called him. Now, we have the, the opportunity to look back in hindsight. But if I was Jeremiah at that time and God said to me, hey, I'd like you to go out and speak to the kings and the priests and the people and tell them all of the things that's going to happen, I reckon I'd be a dash reluctant myself. But what God said to Jeremiah was, I don't need your excuses. I need your heart. I need a can-do attitude. See, a can-do attitude, as it says in Romans, is the transformation of our mind. See, transformation is one of those things that just doesn't happen with a good mindset, self-discipline. Genuine transformation only comes through Holy Spirit. Genuine transformation is only something if you're willing to submit to the Holy Spirit and then apply that discipline in your life. That's two words that the world don't really like to use these days, submission and discipline. But what God's asking us to do is for us to answer the call, we have to be obedient and to submit our lives to his plan and his purposes. We all tend to make excuses for our own actions. We all tend to make excuses for why we shouldn't do something. I'm sure for Jeremiah, it was not only was he a child, but I'm sure he had other things to do, play PlayStation, uh, go get a part-time job, all of those things which were appropriate at the time. But what he said was, oh, I can't do it. And God said, I don't have time for your excuses. Things need to happen. See here, God challenges us. Jeremiah had fear and insecurities, just like all of us. The thing I love about reading this passage is that I'm Jeremiah. I have exactly the same attitudes. I have the exact same excuses. I always find a reason that I'm too busy or I've got something else on. I've got stuff to do with the family. I've got other things that I'm looking forward to doing rather than actually having my ear listening to God and then being obedient in what he's called me to do. Unfortunately, what happens is with excuses, it usually spirals an attitude of negativity. And that's one spiral that's very, very hard to get out of. Negativity can actually produce something that is, is detrimental to our, our walk with God because it produces fear. And what God's after, he's after faith and obedience rather than fear in, and your insecurities. A few years ago, I, had the, uh, I, was, I was struggling with uh, a little bit of mental health. What had happened, I was working for a, a man and I didn't like the job that I was doing and at the same time I had severely hurt my back. 
Um, and I don't know if you've ever tried being a landscaper and a concreter with a crook back, and it doesn't re the two don't really go that well together. So I was really struggling with what I was going to do with my life and my career. And what I found at the time is what I, I thought I'd sit down and have a conversation with my pastor. And in my thought, I thought, he's going to be so loving and kind. He's going to understand exactly where I'm coming from. He's going to really be able to sort of nurture me and help me through this process. That didn't happen. What he did was he laid on the line some fairly honest truths about my own blind spots. The reasons that I was making excuses weren't necessarily valid at all. And what that was is I wasn't hearing from God like Jeremiah. I wasn't having a face-to-face -face conversation with God, but what I was hearing was from someone that God was using to speak through. And I had to hear it. Sometimes excuses uh, limit us in what we can do. But if we are prepared to submit to the will of the Father and answer the call, what that does is it opens up our heart towards him and his plans and his purposes for us. Like I mentioned before, transformation can't be done without Holy Spirit. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 3 says, The fire tests the purity of silver and gold, oh, silver and gold but the Lord tests the heart. Transformation comes through fire. Transformation comes, and if you understand, if we, I could explain this process of gold being transformed from its original state into the beautiful bars that we see on TV, what it does, it, it is melted down in a, in a fire and in a flame. And then what happens is all the impurities come to the surface and then those things get scooped off the top, discarded, it's called the dross, discarded and then it goes again. And it's heated probably seven, eight, nine times to then get a refined piece of gold. It's a bit like our life really, isn't it? It goes into the fire, gets purified by Holy Spirit and transformed and then what happens, it comes out, it gets moulded and shaped again and then it goes back in scoop off all the impurities, and then it goes again. Being transformed by Holy Spirit isn't easy, but if our attitude is based on our inadequacies, we could miss out on what God's got for us. And the third point in regards to hearing from God or answering the call is that he doesn't want us to hesitate. See, at the start, as we read at verse 6, Jeremiah hesitated. But then in verse 17, it says, if I can bring my Bible up. Verse 17 says this, Get yourself ready. Stand up and say to them whatever I command you. Do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, and an iron pillar, and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the king of Judah, its officials, its priests, and its people of the land. They will fight against you, but you will overcome, you will not, they will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Verse 17 says, get yourself ready. In the original, it says, or in the Amplified Bible, it says the best, the best use of this passage ever in Scripture. It says, gird up your loins. Gird up your loins. Now, I don't technically go around saying the word loins a lot, but it is an unusual term to use, gird up your loins. And I thought, what does that mean? Gird up your loins. And what it meant is, is that they wore robes and they had to pick up their robe and tuck it into their belt or their girdle, ready for action. You know, you don't hear the word gird up your loins much these days. <laughs> so it's like, ready, gird up your loins, go. No, it's ready, set, go. Um, but we, um, or we, we wear robes during the week, but it's, it's, we're, um, <laughs> it's, it's more just inside action. It says, be ready. Gird up your loins, get yourself ready, 
don't hesitate. God completed his instructions to Jeremiah by telling him to get ready and to prepare, not to make excuses. Go to where he was telling him to go, say what he wanted him to say. But at no time did God ever say to him it was going to be easy. See, there was no time that God said to him, okay, now that you're going to do exactly what I've called you to do and you've been obedient and you've done all those things, then it's smooth sailing. Unfortunately, that's not the case in our lives. See, what happens is we talk about transformation and being transformed, and and this is what was happening in, in Jeremiah at this very point, is that God was continually transforming him that there is a process that we have to go through, which is the hardening process. Has anyone ever watched Forged in Fire? Forged in Fire? I got addicted to that show about 12 months ago, and I don't really watch a lot of TV and binge, but I love that show. It's about, if you've ever watched it, it's about using old school blacksmith techniques. And what they do is they get this lump of steel, and then they have to, it's a challenge, so it's a TV show, so they have to make it interesting. Um, and what they do is they take that bit of steel and they have to then forge a weapon out of it, a knife, a sword, or, or some such. Now, it's the most incredible process. One, I, I never really quite understood what blacksmithing was and the effort that it took. And then if I look at it in ancient times, I felt really sorry for the blacksmiths who had to do this. But what they do is they get that bit of steel or that bit of metal and they stick it in the the forge, which is the part where the fire, it's like a giant pizza oven, they stick it in there and it gets red hot. And I don't know if you've ever tried to um, bang steel into shape, but you can't do it when it's cold. It just bounces right back off. But when you stick it in the forge and it becomes hot, it goes red and then you can start banging and shaping it. And so these guys get out these giant hammers and they're on the anvil and they're banging and they're banging and they're banging and then they have to stick it back in the forge, pull it back out, bang, bang, bang. And I sort of thought to myself, that's our life, isn't it? We go into the fire, come out, God, bang, 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 in you go again, out you come, bang, bang, bang. (laughs) And it's not bang in like in a bad sense, but it's bang as in what he's doing is he's shaping you. See, you're his workmanship at that point. It's the, it's the forging, it's the, it's the banging into shape. And then what happens is once he's finished banging you to pieces, hopefully not into pieces, but into, into a shape of a knife, there's a process called the hardening process where you take that bit of hot steel and you plunge it into oil. Because if you didn't do that, what would happen is when you go to put the bit of steel on the grinder to sharpen it up, it's just soft steel still. It doesn't have any hardness to it. But the oil seizes it all together, makes the properties of the steel come together so that there's no air pockets or, or, and it just hardens that process up and then it's ready for grinding. And again, that's like our life, isn't it? We're on the, God's got us on the grinding wheel, sort of just back and forth, just shaping and taking away all of those little nicks and imperfections. It's what God does in the transformation process is that it's not easy You're in and out of the fire. You're on the wheel. You're off the wheel. You're banging. You're getting banged around with a mallet. You're getting shaped. But that's what God does because what he wants is a refined masterpiece of a product at the end. He doesn't want just average people. He doesn't want us to be just average. See, my call is different to Ray's call. Ray's calls, different to Damo's call. Some people are called to go do amazing things. Some people are just called to pray. Some people are called to raise their family and be the best dad or the best husband they have to be. Not every call is some amazing far out thing, but God does have a call for you. God does have a purpose for you. Can I get the worship team to come up, please? See, going back to that forging process, God was saying to Jeremiah, Today I have made you a fortified city into an iron pillar and a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah. And then it says in verse 19, They will fight against you, 
but you will overcome for I am with you and you will be rescued and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. See, when we are stuck in the forge and then out again, that transformation produces strength and hardness. There's something else that every time that we go through a trial, every time we go through a battle, it's another part of the hardening process. It's another part of the forging process. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not belittling hard times. I'm not belittling and making light of challenges. But when we look at the overall picture, is that God knows you and knows you intimately because he's created you and you, you are wonderfully made. You are made in his image. You are his work of art. You are, he's the forgeman or the blacksmith and you are that piece of steel. When we look at the whole picture, he wants us to have the attitude that we are willing to be transformed, that we are willing to submit to his will and his purpose. See, that takes a discipline that costs us something. To submit to his will and his purpose takes a discipline of thinking about it on a daily basis, of looking to him on a daily basis, being in his presence and in his word. It's wonderful to have mornings like we had this morning, just being in God's presence. But it's what we do with that on Monday to Saturday, that really shapes who we are. Where do we sit in that space? And remember, don't hesitate. A couple of weeks ago, I spoke about eyes up and hands ready. See, I really feel that God always wants us to be ready because when he calls us, are we ready to go? Are we in a a position of submission and obedience for when he says go, we're ready to go? Now, I wouldn't be doing this today if I wasn't ready to go. See, if I didn't come up to Queensland and come to this church with a a heart saying, well, whatever, whatever you want, God. If I had kept my own insecurities at the forefront of my life, if I had only acted on my feelings, then I wouldn't have been able to step into what God's called me to do. I'm not trained. But I know that God's got something for us, for me and my family. And I believe he's got the same for you. I'm going to open up an opportunity for people to respond in a second. Because there may be people here that have put the call of God to the side. They've done a bit of a Jonah, like us all. We've all done, the, all done a Jonah, where God says, go that way, and we go that way. We flee as far away from that as possible. There might be some of us who have, have answered the call, but we're in a season where we're not necessarily feeling great about what we're doing feeling a bit flat, feeling a bit meh. And that's okay. God wants your heart more than anything. So this morning, this is a challenge, not to see this is a message for me, not just for you. I'm preaching this because I felt like God had put it on my heart because it speaks to me as well. Am I answering what God's called me to do? Am I putting him first? Is my priority in my life each and every day to seek first the kingdom of God? And if I'm not doing that, then how else, how do I move forward in that? How do I shape it? God's got me on the grindstone once again. God's always knocking. He's always knocking. And so this morning, with every eye closed, this is now an opportunity for us to respond. This morning, if you feel that you've been putting the call of God aside, 
if you've been wondering what it means to hear the voice of God. What does it sound like? What does it look like? How do I know it? If you have maybe experienced the call of God and you felt deflated, you've been hurt, you've been burned by a situation or a circumstance, I encourage you this morning, don't look at your circumstances, but look to Him. So if you are in that space, I'd love to pray for you this morning. I'd love you to respond to Him. So for those who who may feel that this is something for them, I'd just love you to lift your hand. If there is someone here who feels that they have to respond to the call, to answer the call, to lift your hand. And I'm going to pray for you this morning. There may be those that have never actually fully understood what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe never fully understand what it means to have Holy Spirit in your life, to have Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. What does this mean? What does it look like? Who is this Jesus that we sing about? What I do know is that he died on the cross for each and every one of us. That I know that we are designed in his image. We are cared for. He loved the world. God loved the world so much that he sent his only son for us. That's who we serve. That's who, we, that's who loves us. This morning, if you don't know who this Jesus is, if you haven't responded to him and you would like to this morning, I'd ask you to raise your hand as well. And then we'd love to pray for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, for all those that have raised their hands, Lord Jesus, that want to answer the call that you've placed upon their life, Lord Jesus, I pray for them right now. that there is a fresh impartation of Holy Spirit in their life, that there is going to be a transformation process that occurs as they submit to the will of the Father, as they submit to your will and to your purpose, Lord Jesus. I pray that they know that they have been set apart, called by you, as you called Jeremiah, At the tender age of 17, they too are called for a purpose and a plan. We pray, Lord Jesus, that they they don't hesitate, that we don't look to our circumstances, that we don't look to our excuses, Lord Jesus, but we look to you. We don't look at our insecurities, but we look to you, Jesus. We cast our eyes to you and we answer the call and we say yes. We say yes. Thank you, Jesus.